righteous or ordered of the Lord, then it's going to be okay. Amen. So I'm just going to have to, uh, well, anyway, we'll be fine. Father, we thank you for this gorgeous, beautiful, sunny, chilly morning, Lord. Thank you for the two days of winter we get down here. Lord. <laughs> and Lord, this is indeed the day you have made. Yes. So we will rejoice and be glad in it. Lord, thankful for all that are here today. And I do pray uh, that your, your children, your people, your family would be encouraged this day. Whatever burden they may be carrying, I pray, Lord, you'd remind us to lay them at the foot of the cross because you bought us with a price. And Lord, even as we continue to talk about the sovereignty of God today, Lord, I pray that we would be at peace, trusting a God who uh, not only is in charge of all things, but is good, a good, good God. So Lord, help us to truly rest in that, Lord. So Father, be with those who couldn't make it today for whatever reason, or bring them here, Lord. And uh, we're going to trust that you're, you have good things to say to all of us, including me, Lord. I want to hear from you this day as well. Father, we love you, and we know we can only say that because you first loved us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Well, first thing I was going to show you was a quick review of what we, very quick review, of what we were talking about uh, last week as far as the uh, God's sovereignty, and I can't even, uh, I can't even move. I think it's serious what he's doing, huh? But anyway, we talked about four specific characteristics of the sovereignty of God. When we talk about a king being sovereign, we think of them being all powerful, but we realize they're only the only power they have is within their own country. They have no authority outside. You know that that country and of course they're limited in their ability whatnot but when we think about God's sovereignty the four points that I made is that number one it's ultimate rulership or kingship that he is the ultimate you know what ultimate means I mean we, we use that we misuse the word yeah, it means last the last so top would be so if we say this is the this movie is the ultimate, we tend to mean that, oh, it's, it's the best. But what you're really saying is that this is the last. No other movie will come after compared you know, to it. And the reason I know it's last is because one of my favorite words is penultimate, penultimate. You know what penultimate is? <laughs> next to the last. And so if penultimate is next to the last, then ultimate is last. So. What I mean by that is that he's the ultimate ruler or king, is that he is the last, he's the only, really, is that there's no other sovereign in this universe. There can only be room for one sovereign God. You know, that's why the idea of the Greek and Roman gods falls apart in basic logic, because What's the definition of a God? Now, I don't know what the true definition of a Roman or Greek God would be. Apparently it wouldn't be. Well, of course they would say they're very human-like and uh, have human characteristics and, uh, and stuff. But if, if you say Zeus is the ultimate God, I think, I don't know, I don't know my Greek mythology. Zeus, they, I think. They said he was the top one. That he's the top one. But that means other, other <laughs> gods and you, just by definition, that just doesn't work. So anyway, back to the sovereignty of God. Number one, ultimate rulership and kingship. Number two, he has all authority to rule. Is that all authority has been not given to him. He is all authority. He's the ultimate authority. What he says goes. He does whatever pleases him. And whenever we say that, oh, if, if you're doing whatever pleases you, what's the problem with that? If we say that a king, an earthly king, an earthly president, or the richest men in the world, you know, Gates and Beso, how do you say his name? Yeah, or um, Buffett. Buffett and... Uh, yeah, Tesla. You know, yes that they have incredible wealth. 
that they can do incredible things. They can do almost anything they want to, but they really can't. I mean, they have more, you know, authority in one sense than us because they can pay off any politician or anyone else, but they, they can't just walk into McDill. I've never been to McDill. I've got to get over there someday. But I'm assuming when you pull up to the front gate, they stop you. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah, they do. And if they, they're going to say to me, uh, can I help you? And I said, yeah, just want to drive around. <laughs> nope, I just want to take a tour of the place on my own. So I'm just going to park over here and wander around. I'm pretty sure they're going to say no. <laughs> I don't have authority, you know, to do that. You know, now the president, he would pull up and say, hello, you know who I am, let me in. And he could go in, but he doesn't have authority to walk into other, um, I probably if our constitution says that he can't walk into our house uninvited, right? Yes. No, seriously though, is that, I would hope if the president came to your house, you'd be a little concerned about the mess you have in there. <laughs> you'd say, wow, come on in. You know, he doesn't have any authority to, even though he's the president of the country. So God has all authority. Then he has the power to rule. Not only is it the, the authority, but he has the power to accomplish what he wants to accomplish. He has, and, and I think we said one of the definitions of sovereignty is that God could fulfill, have no problem because he has the power to always fulfill his will. Whatever God desires, if he desires it, it will come to pass. And then the last crucial part of sovereignty is that you could have a dictator who can do, in a sense, all <laughs> these things. But when we say God can do anything he pleases, when I, that, that was my original question. If we say that one of these rich men can do whatever they want, whatever they please, uh, doesn't that kind of grate you? Doesn't that kind yes. of like, gee, because what's the tendency of the human heart? Okay. Selfish. Yes. Selfish. To ultimately, you know, do whatever and end up hurting people, whatever. But we have a king, an ultimate ruler, yes who's a good, good God. Have you noticed the, uh, no, I can't show you the line right now. Uh, it's right there. Uh, but we've been singing a new song at, at church on uh, called Good. Yeah. Um, and I wish I could remember the, the line right now. But he can't be anything else is the line. It, uh, the song is written by uh, Cody Carnes, who is married to Carrie Job. Is that how you say your name? Yes. And the two of them wrote uh, The Blessing, right. Revelation Song. I mean, they've written some big ones, you know, yeah. but people don't really know much about him, but he wrote that song. And when we sing it, I'm looking at it and going, yeah, we're just talking about the attributes of God. <laughs> because God is good and he can't be anything else. Now, that doesn't mean he can't be merciful, whatever. What it means is he cannot not be good. And that goes back to our definitions of you know, the aseity of God, the simplicity of God, that all his attributes are, I hate to use the word, blended into one, is that God cannot not be, you know, good. So we see there that we have a good, good God. Now, with that in mind, I wanted to talk about, I told you that this is the last thing we we're talking about. I want to talk about three wonderful gifts that we have. Oh, I'm looking at this. You don't see it. Three wonderful gifts of knowing and serving and worshiping a sovereign God. And that first gift is peace. Now, I, I spoke at the beginning of last session about how anxiety is an issue for, I will say all people. Maybe you're not plagued with anxiety, but all of us deal with worry or over concern or fear or any of those things we we you know get that and even Christians but I believe that when you grasp onto the fact that God is in control of all things and remember all these other points about his ability and his goodness when we grasp the fact that God is sovereign in control of all things when we see the depths 
when we see that in the depths of our soul, that God is sovereign, I believe worry is ultimately thrown out the window. Doesn't mean we won't because we still have this flesh that's going to react to things. But as we grow and mature in a Christian, uh, as a Christian, I'm convinced that as we grow in our maturity, in our sanctification, and our growth to be more like Christ, as we learn more about who God is, then there be less and less and less worry. Okay, now I know some of us are, I hate to use the expression, but we wor we're worry warts, and some of that is how we've been brought up. If you had a mother, or father, but often a mother who was extremely anxious and was always hyper protective. <laughs> I remember a friend of mine, um, <coughs> her and her husband were, were out to dinner with their kids and their, their oldest son might have been eight years old or whatever. And all the kids were adopted, that doesn't matter. And the boy, they're at a restaurant, the boy says, I need to go to the restroom. And so the, uh, He's old enough now to go to the restroom on his own. And apparently it was within the earsight. So he gets up to go and his mom says out in a rather loud voice, don't let anyone touch you in there. Wow, what a freaky thing to say to your child in a restaurant as your child is going in to go to the bathroom. Is that kid gonna have urinary or some other kind of issues in his life because he's walking towards the bathroom and his only concern is someone might touch me in there. Oh, I get it, you know, but that mom's instilling fear into that child. Now, you teach your children when you're at home, you know, the stranger danger and all those sort of things and your privates, no one, you know, gets near them, et cetera, et cetera. That's common sense. That's okay. You don't, in a panic, yell that to your child so other people hear. That's going to freak. So I would not be surprised if that kid grows up with an anxiety issue, a fear issue, because it's been inbred into him. But again, as we, and it doesn't mean that bad things aren't going to happen. We're going to get to that point in a second. But I'm still convinced that since God is in charge, and he's promised us ultimate good for us is that we can trust that he holds tomorrow in the palm of his hand that he's already waiting for us in a sense in the future and since no one can thwart his plans no one can interfere with his ultimate good purposes then we can rest in peace okay now i'm going to get to i don't want to say these things and you sit there and go oh man i'm a mess then I, no, I'm just, each point will build and build on it, but I do believe that this, you know, makes a difference to us. Now, turn with me into John, because I can't put it on the screen, but John 16, uh, we have these, this verse memorized, I always like you to see it, John 16, 33, says this, I have told you these things, now that's everything he said previous to this, but I've told you these things so that in me, now what's it mean in me? Believers. Believers that were in Christ, he's in us, but because we are in Christ, he says here, in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I've overcome the world. Hallelujah. So we have this verse memorized, but do we live it? He has overcome the world. He controls it. We can have his peace. So when things seem to be questionable, when circumstances seem to overwhelm you and I, then remember that God is sovereign. I always go, go think back. I, this was a Christian band many years ago, back in the 80s and 90s. I brought them to the church a number of times. David and the Giants. So if any of you old time Christian rock and rollers, uh, the drummer was uh, Thibodeau, Little Ricky, and I Love Lucy. 
The, I mean, the boy that played little Ricky and I Love Lucy is, I forgot his first name, but Thibodeau, and he was the drummer of this band. But they, they had a song, He's Got It Under Control. And every time I say that, I think of that song. He's got it under, you know, control. And so that he will give us, what does the scripture say? A peace that passes all understanding. I mean, do we stop and think about what that's saying? And I think every one of us have experienced that peace at one time or another. You know, there's a difference of the peace, being at peace with God and the peace of God. We probably talked about this before. All unbelievers, you and I, before we came to face, were at war with God. Well, I was not. If you're not for me, you're against me. That's God's word. We read in Romans 8 and other places in Romans that talks about when we were enemies of God. I, I was God's love. I was never his enemy. If you're not on his side, you, you are. So the beautiful thing is that when we've come to faith and been justified by faith, it says in Romans 5.1, now that we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God. We're no longer at war with God. We are friends. And you know, it's like when, uh, Randy's getting sidetracked, is that when we signed the peace treaty with Japan, I think MacArthur signed it, what did that peace treaty mean? What did it say? What did it ultimately say? I don't mean word for word. What we're was not the, at war with each other. We're not at war. We will not drop another atomic bomb on you. No, you know, we are no longer at war. But did we instantly become friends with Japan? No, of course not. We helped rebuild Japan into a powerful nation now, but you have to admit that we weren't instantly friends with them. I remember seeing a bumper sticker um, when there was the big arguments going on about American cars and foreign cars, especially Japanese cars, is that I saw a bumper sticker that literally said, Remember Pearl Harbor. And I'm thinking, of course, Pearl Harbor was a horrible thing. And of course, we are to always remember 9-11, you know, and we're really not at peace with those who perpetrated 9-11, but are people still holding, you know, Pearl Harbor over the head of Japanese? Well, very few, I don't think. But it was a car issue. Ah, don't buy Japanese cars. Remember Pearl Harbor. I thought, oh, I let that go, you know, for crying out loud. So, but now we are friends with that rock. I just comment that when transistor radios first came out, they were too cheap, but then one would buy them. So when they raised the price, they started selling. Yeah, <laughs> isn't that interesting? <laughs> the American what? You know. So when we signed a peace treaty, we were no longer at war, but we weren't friends. Well, when you say we've been justified by faith, oh good, we're no longer at war with God. But what's the good news? Not only are we no longer at war with God, we're now friends. We now get to sit at the Lord's table as one of his children. Is that that's a powerful, you know, thing. And that's the peace of God that comes to us because we can trust that what God says is true. Remember, God is not wringing his hands and worried that things are gonna turn out okay. Oh, I hope Gary makes the right decision today, because if he doesn't, it's gonna mess up everything. I'm gonna have to change my plans a thousand different ways because Gary drove that way and not that way, or a Gary didn't do, I'm picking on Gary, but you know, whatever, God is not wringing his hands. You know, when, uh, won't ask how many of you had kids, but if most of you have, when your kids were teenagers and they went out in the car, what was the typical reaction for the next couple of hours for the parent? Anxiety. Anxiety, why? Don't want to be in an accident. You're not, yes, but you're not in control. 
you, you can't control what happens, where they go, what they do. Now, nowadays, you can track them on your phone and you can do everything else, but still, you're not in control. You can watch them drive to a place where you know there's bars or I won't even give other examples of things. But just because you know it doesn't mean you can do anything about it. But God not only knows, God can intervene, which we'll get to in a moment here when we talk about the providence of you know, God. So God isn't worried about it. You know, there may be pain and there may be turmoil and heartache, but we can still live with an overriding sense of peace because our king rules and reigns supremely. And don't ever forget, he's a good God. Here's another very familiar, comforting verse, especially when you think of it in terms of, of God's sovereignty. 1 Peter 5, 7, if I put it up there, but you all know it, is that casting all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Okay, we, we all know that verse. I've quoted that verse a thousand times, 10,000 times to people. Now let me ask you, do you believe that I care for you? Yes. Yes. If I know you, and I do, more than likely I care for you. But should you cast all your anxieties on me no. yes. because I care for you? <laughs> Isn't that what some parents do though or some spouses do? Is they carry all the anxiety and fear of their, yes. their loved ones? But you should cast all your cares upon me. Why not? Can't Simple reason because I can do very little to solve or resolve your anxieties. But what is the only reason that we, as redeemed children of God, can cast all of our anxieties and worries and fears and concerns on the Lord? Because He cares for us. But backing his care is his sovereign power to rule over us and our circumstances. So he and he alone is the one that we can trust in difficult times. Yes, we want to trust each other. You know, but if uh, I've, you, I know I've said this to you before, but it's happened to me. I don't, well, I don't know, say a hundred times. I hate to say that, you know, where someone at my church would say to me, oh, you know, Pastor Randy, you know, could you come over and, you know, visit me or whatever? And I, of course, you know, I'll, I'll be over there. And I get sidetracked. And I forget, they're in the hospital. I go, I'll, I'll be over this afternoon. And I get sidetracked. So they're looking forward to the pastor coming over to, to pray with them. Not that I have the, you know, special gift that any of us have Jesus. Is, you know, but I can let him down. Now, it wasn't I was being malicious. I was being human. <laughs> And forgetful shouldn't be but that's what ends up happening you know to us but we have a God that cares for us so we can cast our anxieties upon him so the first beautiful gift of living under God's sovereignty is that we can have a peace the second gift is security in this crazy world we live in there's so many so many live in fear and overloaded with insecurities about themselves their salvation their future but god's sovereignty eliminates all insecurity now i'm still going to be insecure about things but when we're trusting that god is a the big <laughs> He's a big, big God. He's a sovereign God, that he's a good God, that he saved us. And if God's word is true, that he who began a good work in you, what's that good work? Your salvation. He who began that good work in you. So you didn't begin your salvation. He spoke that life into you. What's the rest of the verse say? He's faithful to finish it, complete that work. So we don't have to be insecure about it. I thought about it early this morning. I, when I was on staff here for seven years, it cracks me up when I think about how many different offices I had. I, um, where uh, uh, Pastor Naomi's office is, that was my office for a while. And I, 
I can remember two, many things, but two particular incidents that, that happened in that, that room. And one very quick one, I might have shared it with you, is because I did Sunday morning and Sunday evening announcements, and we just had fun with it, that, and I was a youth pastor, people just, some people, just thought I was just this fun guy. And so um, a woman in the church brought another woman in the church in to see me because this woman was dealing with just really sad depression. Come and sit in my office. And of course, here I am with a counseling background. First thing this woman says to me, who's depressed, she says, don't you dare try to make me laugh. And I thought, how sad. That's who she thinks I am. A comedian, a jokester, whatever. And I said, trust me, I'm not going to try to make you laugh. But that's, I just threw that story for free. The other, <laughs> but here's the other story that I'm getting at. And this was a very, to me, it was very, very sad. Young lady in her 20s, single lady, part of the church, have not seen her a gazillion years. I do hope that she's doing well. <clears throat> Calls up the church on a Monday, and I was one of the only pastors here. I think you might have known, maybe you didn't know, but years ago, some of the pastors had Friday off, some of them had Monday off. So when the Friday guys were, well, on Monday, I was just one of the few pastors that was here. This gal calls, you know, can I come in and, and talk to someone? I'm very, very disturbed about something that happened last night in the service, in the Sunday evening service, or whatever, I forget how she ordered. So by all means, go on in, I'm free. She comes in, sits down, and says, I've lost my salvation. I've done something horrible. And I've lost my salvation. And I'm sitting here thinking, number one, I don't want to stir up your theology, but I tend to believe that if you've truly come to faith in Christ, he's going to keep you. You know, but that's another, another story. But so, but I want to know. I'm, I can't imagine. My head's going. You know, what horrible thing did she do? And I go, okay, what's, what's on your heart? Last night during the uh, service, we were singing uh, worship songs to the Lord. And uh, I had some terrible, lustful thoughts come into my mind. And uh, that's the worst. I've lost my salvation. And I took a big sigh, number one. <laughs> I didn't want, you know, as a pastor, if someone confesses something to you, it stays with you, you know. What, and then I'm talking serious things, too. It's that confidentiality thing. If someone tells me they've murdered someone, I can't call the police, but I need to try to talk them into turning themselves in and making sure they're not going to hurt someone else. Because if they are, then I do have to turn them in. That's not the whole story. So I'm relieved that she's, you know, and I don't know if I said, oh, is that all? You know, do you want to know what goes on in my head? It's a scary place. It's a very scary place. Now, the, the, the point at this juncture isn't an issue on the security of the believer. In her case, it was an incredible insecurity in life in general and especially about her faith. How can anyone enjoy the Christian life if they're constantly walking on eggs? Now, I don't know, I don't wanna stir up something that's going to hurt you, but if, if any of you were brought up by a, a father that was <clears throat> very mean, that was a drinker, he'd come home and you'd be fearful and you'd hide in your room. I mean, I've, I've talked with people, I've known people who, I've gone through that, and that's a horrible thing for a child to, to go through. But if you're walking around like that thinking your Heavenly Father is walking around like that, looking at you, you didn't pray long enough today. You didn't read the Word today. You know, you whatever, and I'm going to get you for that. That's a sad, sad place to be. But if you know, your God's in control of all things, and that he's a good, good God, that if he started that work in you, 
he's going to finish it. Hebrews 13, 5 and 6 says, um, I don't have a right exact, well, I'll turn to it. Is, you're again very familiar with this, but it's a very interesting verse that um, people don't often think about. Uh, starting in verse, what did I say? 5, 13, 5. Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. So we say with confidence, the Lord is my helper. I will not be afraid. What can mortals do to me? Now, I always found it interesting that that verse, that whole portion starts with, Keep your lives free from the love of money and be content with what you have because God has said, never will I leave you, never will I forsake you. And when you think about it at first, it's like, what's the connection? Don't love money excessively and because I'll never leave you nor forsake you. Anyone want to take a stab at why that says that? Well, people are trying to gain all this wealth for the, quote, power that I'm safe now. Mm -hmm. I'm safe from anything that can come against me, mm -hmm. you know, and it's the grand disillusion. Yes, exactly. And the next part of it says to you, your money is not going to take care of you. Your money is not going to bring in the ultimate peace and security because we know that you can earn a lot, but then you can end up losing it all right away. So what he's saying is to you, is the Lord is my helper, I will not be afraid. What can man do to me? If I lose all my money, I'm still secure because he will never leave me nor forsake me. And of course, Romans 8, 35 to 39. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble? or hardship, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or danger, or sword. As it is written, for your sake we face death all day long. We are considered as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced. Now if the Apostle Paul says he's convinced, I mean, he's convinced. <laughs> for I am convinced that neither death nor light, neither angels, nor demons, neither the present, nor the future, or any power, neither height or depth, or anything else in all creation, that covers everything, will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. So the next time your boss, and most of you are, or a couple of you are working outside the home, Next time your boss, your enemy, or anyone else threatens or scares you, the next time the devil says, oh, oh, that sin was a big one. I bet God can't forgive you. You just lost that salvation. You need to remember that God is in charge, not your boss, not your enemy, not the devil or anyone else. If the Lord says that nothing will separate you from the love of God, as it is in Christ Jesus. Sidebar, I've heard many people say, you know, that nothing will ever separate you from the love of God, which is true, but it's important that you tag on the rest of the verse. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Not just God. Everyone, not everyone, but a lot of people believe in God. No, it's nothing will separate us from the love of God. That is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Lord. So you can be secure and know that you're safe in the arms of a big, big, big God. I, I almost said I apologize for harping on this, but I'm not apologizing for talking about God's word here. But John 10, 27. My sheep, oh, what a powerful chapter. Yeah. My sheep, who are my sheep? Who are, it's Christ talking. Who are his sheep? All believers. All believers. My sheep. Where I go? Listen to my voice. I know them, and they follow me. I give them eternal life, and they shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. 
My Father who has given them to me is greater than all. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. I and the Father are one. You want to talk about being secure? No one can snatch you out of Jesus' hand. And then he adds, no one can snatch you out of the Father's mm -hmm. hand, which is a beautiful uh, show of God's Christ deity. You know, but that's how secure we are. So, resting in God's sovereignty, we know we're at peace and we're secure. The third gift that comes in trusting God's sovereignty is comfort. We live in a world where there is so much trouble, so much suffering, even for the Christians. Bad things do happen to good people. The truth of the matter is nobody's good. You know, but in Christ, I, I get that. But even those who walk with Christ, bad things happen. The Lord never promised us that we wouldn't face trouble. But and, and that's a problem that we have sometimes with new believers, is we give them this this false sense that all your troubles will go away now. You know, I've I've uh, often told people that, and forgive me again because probably somewhere along the line I've shared this, you know, with you, but. When you're uh, talking with a, a unbelieving friend who's going through a very, very difficult time, their spouse just left them. They are devastated. And in your mind, understandably so, you're thinking, oh, they are ripe for the gospel. And they are. Most people, no, a lot of people come to faith when there's turmoil in their life. Let me just ask you, any of you come to faith when there was particular turmoil in your in your life? Yes. Okay. Yes. And that's wonderful. But one of the built-in problems we're not careful is that what do we subconsciously are possibly telling the person about them needing Jesus? What what is the reasoning behind it? If your friend has just said to you, My spouse has left me, my life is over, and you say, Oh gosh. You know, Jesus wants to comfort you right now. You need Jesus. So let's pray this prayer. Okay. Now, why did they say okay? Get rid of you. Well, to get rid of you. It might possibly be. Because you have inadvertently promised them that, in, in, without even realizing it, that their husband will come back, in a sense. That God's going to fix this for you right now. But when we're leading someone to Christ, when we're sharing the gospel, what's the ultimate goal? What do they need to see? What do they need to... I don't want to get tied up here in sinner's prayers, but what do they need to say that 99% of sinner's prayers don't ever say? What's that? Repent. Is that, you know, I know you're hurting right now because your husband's left. And I'm not going to promise <coughs> you that your husband's going to come back. I'll, I'll pray that he will see and understand and will come back. But it's at times like this when we realize that, you know, we have no invisible means of support. In other words, we're, we're not trusting in a God that, that loves us. And we we need to understand that we are lost. We are sinners. We are enemies of God. Now, I'm not promising your husband to come back, but I'm promising you something even better, that anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Not anyone who calls on the name of the Lord will get their husband back, but they will be saved. And isn't that what that person needs, your friend needs, more than their husband coming back? I mean, I hope you, I, I know you understand that. Of course we want their husband to come back, but what is eternity? What if you gained everything in this world and lose your soul? What if you gain your husband to come back and you lose your soul? So that person needs to see that they're a sinner and that they need Jesus and that they need to be forgiven and that only happens when we repent of our sins. Lord, I'm a sinner. I have, you know, 
walked against you all my life and Lord I'm wrong and I now see what Christ has done for me I don't understand it completely but I now see that if I confess my sins and I'm not gonna have a long list of them because what I have to remember everything, the bottom line is Lord I can't save myself I can't forgive myself Lord please forgive me I am a sinner forgive me my sins I I turn from them to the best of my ability I turn and I'm gonna need your help and your spirit to keep me from turning because we all know that we fall short we're gonna whatever sin it is we stumble in we'll probably stumble in it again but ultimately Lord I, I repent of my sins that's where the salvation really starts and I'm sorry I got off on to that you know <laughs> I mean I'm not sorry but I don't know where why I'm even telling you that why I'm not telling you that about comfort so our great comfort comes from knowing that we have a God that's in charge that he's a good God and that he rules over this universe and ourselves and so that I can be comforted in times of trouble Romans 8 28 all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose now it didn't say all things are good because bad things aren't good but all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and are called according to his purpose how can all things work together for good unless what unless God is in charge we, we, we can't say that I, I can't and please please don't say to an unbelieving friend hey all things work together for good because what's the rest of the verse to those who love the Lord to those who love the Lord you know what your unbelieving friend if they're going through a tragedy there is no guarantee that this is going to turn into good because that's not what the verse says all things work together for good to those who love the Lord and called according to his purpose. So for you and I, when we're going through a, a tough time, we can be comforted. Now, your, your spouse passes away. It's a sad thing. I, I get it. I'm looking out at you, and I know that that's happened to a, you know, a couple of you here. It's a very, very sad thing. I'm not going to whitewash that and say, hallelujah, they're with Jesus. They, they are if they know Christ I'm, I'm sorry I'm looking at Ron here and I knew and loved his wife dearly one of the sweetest woman women I ever knew in my life and she passed away a number of years ago she's with Jesus absolutely no doubt about that at all but Ron I hate to bring it up but do you still sometimes think about Sandy and feel sad sure of course of course but how many years has it been for this month for this month can you say, I'm putting you on the spot, that you have found comfort in the Lord despite your pain, even though you're still dealing with it or whatever? In this situation, it was the best thing for her mm -hmm. because she was suffering on earth. But that's not always the case. So, I mean, I think it's a catch-22. Mm -hmm. I think people that lose their loved one with no, that are totally healthy. Mm -hmm. It's tougher to take. Oh, absolutely. 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 So my, my point is, and, and I, I think Ron understands and you do too, is that our God's a God of comfort. He didn't say that I'm not going to have, you're not going to have control in your life. And that's the mistake we make, going back to what I originally said, of somehow falsely assuring people, all your troubles are going to go away. And that we always have this big plastic smile on our face is that... I get the joy of the Lord. That's wonderful. We need to be positive and affirming or whatever, but we also need to be able to say, you know what? Life stinks sometimes because we live in a fallen world, but I'm glad I trust a sovereign God Amen. who can comfort me, who cares about me. Do not let your hearts be troubled. Trust in God. Trust also in me. Okay. Uh, one last verse here, and then we're, we'll move on. Uh, 2 Corinthians 1 3. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort. Now, he is not the God that Rabbi Kirshner was talking about in his book When Bad Things Happen to Good People, because he says 
that God is good and will comfort after the fact they'll pat you on the head and love you and bring some nice friends around to encourage you but his God is not you know omnipotent not sovereign I didn't use this phrase last time but in talking about Rabbi Kirshner's idea of a good comforting God who's not omnipotent that's called a fancy term finite Godism that it makes God finite in a sense he's not all powerful he's finite gee I wish I could have done something <coughs> to stop that illness to stop that accident to stop your child from being born with progeria boy see that's the deist God of the 18th century the deist God that is a good God who makes everything and then backs off and says see you later you're on your own I'll comfort in times you know that's that's the God of the Enlightenment is that oh yeah we believe in God he's good he created everything but then he wound the watch up and said you're on your own take care of that watch I may intervene and and help out so God's sovereignty again may be a mystery to us we don't understand how he can control all things yet we are somewhat free to decide for ourselves and I say somewhat free because we are not completely free you are not free to jump off the building without getting hurt you're not free to walk into MacDill Air Force Base you know we have freedom but God is absolutely free and always uses it for the best these things may be mysteries to us, but I'll tell you what I do know. Our God is the King of Kings. He has all authority to do as he pleases. He has all power to accomplish what he desires. And he's a very, very, very good God. And please don't ever forget that. His sovereignty brings a peace that passes all understanding. His sovereignty brings a sense of security in a very insecure world. And his sovereignty brings me comfort in times of suffering and in trouble. Kings may have their little countries with some power, some authority, some rule, and with some goodness. But it's all a grain of sand when compared to God's <coughs> rulership. Real quick story. How are we doing here with time? Because, oh my goodness, we have more good things to talk about. You know, next week we're going to talk about God's providence. So maybe I'll just end. Oh, I did start a little late, but I'm still not going to abuse that. But let me tell you a little story about my youth. Is that um, I'm of the generation that we walked to school, and I walked to school since I was in kindergarten, and walked and had to have been a mile and a half or so, and it was across a couple semi busy streets through a couple backyards, cutting down. I mean, it was can't do that nowadays but anyway so I must have been in about fourth grade I'm gonna say fourth grade I'm walking home by myself and this boy who was a year older than me jumps out of the bushes and comes over and starts pushing me around and threatening me and scaring me and it's freaking me out because you know I'd never been confronted like that before or whatever and I, oh, you know and I ran home and the next day he did it again, you know, and the next day on the playground, you know, and I'm just terrorized. Now, he didn't beat me up, but he pushed me around and just scared me, whatever. Come to find out, I lived on a hill, Randolph Ave, that this boy lived at the bottom of the hill in some housing that were really low income. Well, my, my street had these beautiful old houses in North Jersey. I'm not saying they were man they were mansions at all, but they were just, you know, and I was a middle class, but at the very end bottom of the street, there was a row of houses that were pretty much low income, and that's where this boy lived. But he was never involved with anything up here with all my friends and whatever. So one day I go down from my house halfway to where he lives, not even thinking about that, and I go to visit my friend Paul Ferguson, who's a couple years older than me. And I knock on the door or whatever, and I don't know if his mom said, oh, he'll be out in a little bit. So I'm standing in his side yard, right where my road is. All of a sudden, this kid shows up. And I go, oh my goodness, I can't even go home. 
and I'm terrorized, you know, by this kid. And so he's threatening me and whatever. And then from across the street comes a friend of mine who was probably, if I was in fourth grade, he might have been a freshman or sophomore in high school. Eddie, Eddie DeAnne. Eddie DeAnne. And, and I, I had the wonderful privilege, because I was a, a good athlete, a good baseball player, that I could play with uh, kids my age in, in, around here. That's how I, I, I throw lefty, bat righty, but I learned the bat left-handed because when I played with my friends, how do you say it humbly? I was too good. So I learned the bat left-handed, uh, you know. But I also could play with the big guys. I mean, they let me, as a young guy, play with the big guys. So here comes Eddie DeAnne. He comes across the street and says to this kid, hey, who do you think you are messing with my friend Randy? You get away from him, and I don't ever, ever want to hear. And now Eddie doesn't know that he's been kind of terrorizing me. I don't ever want to hear that you mess with him or touch him again, because if you do, you have to deal with me. And that kid turned around and sprinted down the street. Yeah. <laughs> the next day at school, somebody, I don't know who, must have said something to the principal. I don't remember saying this to a teacher or whatever, but someone said to the principal, Mr. Duffy, that so-and-so has been terrorizing Randy. And so I'm called down to the office. And as I come down to the office, here's this boy that he's been called into the office and the principal wants to tell him, you don't mess with Randy. So I come in and the principal says, I hear you've been picking on Randy. And the kid starts bawling. <laughs> I'll never, I'll never mess with him again. He's sick. He, he sent his big brother, his big brother on me. And so I would never, ever do anything again. And he never bothered me again. And I thought, how interesting. Eddie was not my big brother, but he thought it was. Eddie was just a friend that, that cared. And I was never bothered by him, you know, again. Now, I tell you that story because we have a big, big sovereign yeah. God. Yeah. That even though we're going to face trouble, I'm not saying that in comparing Eddie to God that you're never, 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 never going to have trouble again. You may be tormented by that next door neighbor, you know, continuously, whatever. But as a big sovereign God, who loves us and is good, he's gonna take care of his children, even in those toughest times. So I spent so much time and I got more important things on a related subject to talk about next week because I am just so convinced in my heart that when you truly understand what God's word says about God being sovereign in charge of all things and loving us, we can experience that peace that passes all understanding. We can rest secure in him, and we will know that we're comforted. I love this quote. I think it's from uh, Charles Spurgeon. When we go through a trial, the sovereignty of God is the pillow on which you lay your head. <laughs> is that when we go to bed at night, knowing that we're going through a trial. <clears throat> God's sovereignty is that pillow where you can lay your head down and say, this really stinks right now. Yeah. I'm really sad right now. I'm really anxious right now. But God knows what he's doing. And he loves me. And he's going to take care of me. Now what I want to do next week is I want to talk about an aspect of God's sovereignty that i said something about last week. I want to talk about providence. Providence is a very beautiful, special part of God's sovereignty. And providence, if you're not familiar with it right now, it's not a word that's that's used in a, a lot of settings. But our, I think I told you last week, our uh, nation's fathers, 
Did, didn't I mention that to you? Yep. Yeah. Talked about providence yes. because they were reluctant to talk too strongly about Jesus Christ. So they talked about God and literally called him providence. The reason Providence, Rhode Island is called Providence is because Roger Williams was chased out of Massachusetts for some issue, settled in Rhode Island in that area, and said it's by God's good or benevolent providence that we've been brought to this area. And so we called that Providence. Providence, I'll say much more about it, is the Lord in his involvement in our everyday life. And I'm, I'm not only gonna show you some beautiful biblical examples, and I'll throw out a couple to you right now, with David, we'll talk about it next, next week, Esther, Joseph, and many, many others, where God was intimately involved in things that went on, and I sum it all up by, I think what I said last week to you is that, um, a coincidence is something that God does anonymously. When we say, well, what a coincidence that I should bump into you. I don't believe in coincidences. But I believe that the Lord brought that about, you know, for a particular, you know, reason. If I'm thinking of someone, if someone pops into my head, you know how our neurotransmitters are just, you know, always thinking. If I think of an old high school friend, instead of just thinking about him, I pray for him right then and there. Lord, I don't know why Jan Thwaites has just popped into my head. And I don't know what she's doing right now, what's going on in her life. But Lord, please protect her. Please be with her. Please reveal yourself to her, whatever. Or when I, I wrote someone just last night, a friend, and said, I was just thinking about you. And this guy said to me, I can't believe that you were just thinking about me because I was just thinking about you. Wow. And I'm, and the reason I was thinking, and I, and I jokingly said, what are you thinking about? You know, I wanna kill you, I wanna, you know, whatever. And he says, I'm going through my grandson, my granddaughter has been dealing with some suicidal thoughts, or whatever, and I was just thinking about you. And so now, here I'm thinking about them, so now we're talking to each other, encouraging her, you know, about dealing with, you know, what's going on or whatever. Now, I'm not saying that happens 24 hours a day, but that's not a coincidence. Is that that's the Lord saying, you know, but you're going to see how the Lord's involved in our life, even in the difficult things in our life that we want to usually blame the devil for and things like that. You're going to see that, well, We'll wait till next week. <laughs> Comments, questions? And I'm going to figure out what's going on with this thing, too. I have a quick comment. Yeah, sure, ma'am. When, when you were talking about peace with Japan on the treaty that we made, it also involves surrender. Surrender on their part. Yes, absolutely. Yes. And that we, Japan, is not going to provoke more trouble. Okay, that's, that's part of the arrangement. Well, in a sense, when we sign, in a sense, in the blood of Jesus Christ, the peace treaty, you know, we're no longer his enemies, and what we're saying is, Lord, I repent. Right. Now, if Japan blew it and dropped a bomb over here or whatever, well, we'd be very disappointed and probably, you know, call them on the carpet and it might be another act of war. When you and I say, Lord, I, I repent of my sins, and, and Lord, this particular sin, you know, there was a, a man in my, the men's group last, last night who talked about seven years ago. He said, I should be dead. He says, I got a sickness right now, cirrhosis of the liver and other, other things because I shared needles with other people, you know, and God just saved me, and that's not a part of my, my life. What well, do you think when he came to faith in Christ, that seven years ago, whenever it was, that he didn't fall a couple times with that. I, I mean, I, I hope he didn't, but we know. I'm sure he did, just like you and I. So it's not like God's going to say, that's it, we're back at war. Is that That's the beautiful difference, is that, yes, we surrender, 
and it's an ongoing surrender yeah. every day. Is Lord, I can't do this on my own. Just because I've, I'm now justified, now that I'm, my name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life, I'm seated in heavenly places, all those beautiful promises, that doesn't mean I'm not going to fall short again. I'm going to do what I can by the grace and spirit of God not to. But it's so wonderful to know that I can say to my father, Lord, I'm wrong. I'm, I've sinned. Please forgive me. And he says, of course I do. Now go and sin no more. But if you do, I'm here. And there, there will be consequences. So anyway, don't get me going. All right. Father, thank you for meeting here with us today. Lord, thank you for the peace for the security and for the comfort that comes in knowing that we have a big, big God, a sovereign God that rules and reigns over this universe, over our lives. Lord, we didn't talk about it, but even over the weather. You're the weatherman. Your word tells us you are. So Lord, we can trust you in your word. So help us, Father, to live in peace. Help us, Lord, to cast all of our anxieties upon you. That, that the next time we say that verse to ourselves or to someone else, we'll truly grasp what that means. That you do care for us. And that you're able, Father. So, Lord, we love you. Thank you for your amazing grace towards us. Bless your people today. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Thank you, Lord, for encouraging. Thank you, folks, for encouraging have a great day. Thank you for using Pastor Andy as a wonderful vessel. Yes. <laughs>